Good morning, and welcome to the Buildings IoT Forum, where IoT is not the end, but the means to an end. I'm Anthony Kapkin, editor of Buildings IoT Canada magazine and your moderator. Before we get to our speakers, Nadal and Alex, I want to remind everyone that we have three more sessions pre-recorded, which you can view at your convenience. Private Networks and Infrastructure Supporting IoT with Brian Jones of Graybar Canada. The Infrastructure You Need for the Solution You Want with Henry Frank of Belden. Unpacking a Successful Multifamily Technology Platform with Ted Maulucci of Smart One Solutions. These pre-recorded sessions are part of the forum and will be published on the forum's landing page at biotcanada.ca. They will be joined by recordings of today's sessions too, so don't forget to bookmark. It's tough to put on an event of this caliber without the help of some amazing sponsors. WatchNet is a leading manufacturer and supplier of quality video surveillance equipment, access control, and industrial IoT, as well as networking devices and solutions. Visit watchnetinc.com. Since 1912, Siemens Canada has stood for engineering excellence, innovation, quality, and reliability. The company is active across the country, focusing on the areas of power generation and distribution, intelligent infrastructure for buildings and distributed energy systems, and automation and digitalization in the process and manufacturing industries. The company employs about 4,000 Canadians, one of them coming up soon, coast to coast across 27 office and production facilities. Visit Siemens.ca. A project management professional, Dr. Nadal Kwasmi is IoT Solution Manager with IBM's IoT and Industry 4.0 practice. He possesses a PhD in Electrical and Computer Engineering, a Master's in Information Technology Security, and a Bachelor's in Computer Science. Nadal will discuss the building blocks of an IoT solution. Nadal, over to you. Uh, I'm going to be uh, uh, talking about the building blocks for uh, for IoT solutions, and I thought maybe it's a good start to uh, talk about how national leaders, even before the era of IoT and emerging technology, perceive the the building and the influence of their building on on how they do and perform their work. And, and, and they came across this quote from Winston Churchill. Uh, during the debate on how they uh, want to construct uh, the common shrimper. And he said, we shape our buildings and afterward our buildings shape us. It's actually indeed uh, uh, that's, that's the case where, where the building and the way we design and construct uh, our building is, has, has influence and it, it does influence our, our uh, uh, way of doing business and how we conduct uh, 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 our day-to-day uh, -day, uh, operation and, and, and life within the buildings. Uh, and, and also that, that building will impact our personality and how we are interacting with each other. And, and that's clearly what uh, Winston Churchill thought in, in, uh, in how to design the chamber. Is it a rectangle? A uh, rectangle kind of uh, uh, shape where it, 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 it show the two-party uh, uh, two-party model that they have in UK at that time, or or maybe move to the uh, semicircle shape, but they thought that rectangle is going to give them that 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 influence and that uh, facilitate their uh, their uh, uh, their way of doing work as a two two-party uh, uh, model. So that's that's really interesting to know how national leaders thought about it. So uh, knowing that then. Uh, uh, that the building has influenced our our uh, way of doing business and in influence eventually influ influence our productivity and our personality uh, for the occupant of of that building. Then what's what's uh, the journey uh, uh, for the IoT and how we can equip our uh, our building with devices that can help us understand uh, uh, more of how the building 
is 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 working, uh, getting more inside information about uh, the building and how that building will eventually influence us. The the journey is four step journey for for IoT maturity. Uh, first, we start with collecting data from different assets, different devices that you have in the building. Uh, uh, that collection is actually a continuous process during the whole journey you're not going to stop at certain time and then build on uh, the other or move on to the next block it's a continuous journey then after you collecting these data and we're going to touch on the next slide on how or different uh, different ways to collect uh, information from the building but that's the first step then we take that data and try to think of what's the best way of visualizing and presenting this data to the end user so it can help them in their day-to-day -day operation. Uh, it's a very strong and, and important step because the data, it's, it's, it's just numbers uh, and without the uh, visualization and right to the representation of that, the user will not understand it and, or maybe it's gonna be hard to understand. The, uh, the third step is getting inside from that data, uh, uh, linking those dots together, getting the data from different devices and building the data analogy model where we can uh, get more inside information, see, see the pattern, see the relation between different kinds of data and the anomaly, if, there, if there's any anomaly within the data. And the top level of this journey where we all want to go and reach to that level is a cognitive, uh, a cognitive uh, uh, model uh, uh, where you can uh, uh, add a, a, a cognitive machine learning model like natural language processing and so on and so forth and also uh, making the model more adaptive, more, uh, more uh, uh, flexible and, and, and ready to kind of adjust based on new uh, changes within, within, uh, within the building's uh, parameters. So th this is, uh, in a nutshell, a very high level uh, architecture of uh, the building blocks uh, for, for the building. It, it starts with the assets that you have in the building, like uh, HVAC, boiler, bombs, whatever you have, elevators, anything uh, uh, you have in the building. And that, that asset, it has uh, some connection to the uh, building automation system or BAS, uh, uh, and, and, and the data goes through that through using so, so certain protocol uh, and, and stored in, in, in command by that system. Or there's different alternative is that you can go from those assets to some kind of middleware where uh, you can build some, some new asset. If you don't have a BAS system, uh, you can uh, use that data directly in the middleware uh, artifact and then moving that data into IoT platform. So uh, uh, we have up, up until now, we trying to collect the data uh, up until the IoT platform, we try to collect the data from the different kind of assets within the building. Now that's one typical route for, for big building, but imagine if you don't have those uh, protocol, this malware or you have is an old building, and you want to equip them with some kind of sensor and you, you try to collect the data uh, from the scratch, let's say, and, 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 and that's, that's another route, if you can see it uh, at the bottom of this uh, uh, image where we see the sensor, those are a new sensor devices where you can equip them, uh, uh, equip your building with those sensor and new devices and collect the data through a, a gateway and then move that data uh, to your IoT platform. So you have a different route here and, and it'll, it'll show you that uh, IoT solution is not only for a new building or for advanced kind of uh, automated building, but it can also be for an old building where they don't have those system and you can use those uh, uh, sensors which are available in the market to equip your building and upgrade your building with the sensor data that can give you more inside information of, of the building. So the, the, the idea here is to collect as much as we can of the data from the building, whatever is available, and pass that data 
into an IoT platform where the platform is responsible of collecting and storing that data. And it's there where you can also build the data analytical model, which we referred and talked about it in the previous slide, where you can build those model to get you more, uh, more uh, inside information about the different kind of data that you collected from, from your system. And the last layer uh, is the visualization. And we talked about it in, during that uh, different, uh, the previous slide is how you want to represent the data. Are you using dashboard, report, scorecard, mobile, uh, different type of, of uh, presentation, and that's, that's a, a, a separate layer. Uh, if you notice at the top of this image, uh, some, some of these components uh, could be on your prem, uh, premise or it could be on the cloud. It's not necessarily be on the cloud, depends on how you uh, how you want to uh, architect and construct your uh, solution, but uh, it could be uh, on your prem or on on the cloud. So, what's the benefit? Why why are we doing this? Why why we need to spend an extra uh, uh, capital in, in order to to uh, connect our our uh, our building? It, it, there's a huge huge benefit. It's not only uh, reducing cost. Uh, it's also about uh, operation efficiency. It's about occupant experience. It's also about reduced risk. Uh, if if we have uh, uh, our building uh, connected and we uh, get more insight about, let's say, how the electrical system works, how the uh, how the uh, uh, the HVAC system works, how how different kind of system interacting with each other. Uh, we can uh, get lots of benefit out of that. Uh, main, mainly we can, uh, and this is, um, in my mind, is the biggest, uh, biggest benefit, is that we are shifting our thinking from a schedule maintenance to on-demand maintenance. Like, it, it doesn't really uh, necessary to do some schedule maintenance where the equipment that you're going to maintain, maintain doesn't need or does not require that. By adding these uh, uh, facility, uh, this uh, f features or functionality where you can tell when the machine needs to be maintained, it's going to save lots of money. Uh, it, it's the same thing uh, where it happened when you have a public buildings and you 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 servicing the let's say uh, 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 common areas or or uh, or washrooms or or others. And you know, like nobody used that for for a while. Why why you need to send people to service it? But well, well, nobody used it for for a while. So, uh, shifting from schedule demand to on demand, I think that's 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 a big shift in how we do business and how we contracting other uh, 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 service provider to min to maintain and service our building. Uh, the other thing I, I think it's also significant. Uh, is 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 the ability after we get and collect lots of information about about our building is building a digital twins which is basically a digital replica of our building so that will enable us to kind of do any changes that we think it's 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 needed for our building and get the impact of that change before even physically do it. Uh, implemented it in a real uh, in real building. So that will save us lots of time and lots of money. It's also it give us a flexibility to do different scenarios, different uh, uh, ideas and see what's the impact on our building. That's a, that's a, like a, a very advanced goal, uh, but the uh, IoT building, IoT solution in our building is getting us one step closer to be able to have a digital twin for our building, and and also this one will help us in designing a future uh, future uh, building as as well. Uh, the occupant experience, I think that's really important. Any project, in my mind, any project uh, for IT solutions should focus on increasing productivity of the occupant, and and this is maybe in the commercial uh, building is a valid. Uh, 
uh, objective uh, maybe in 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 a uh, residential it's a different objective but uh, uh, keeping or or focusing on a productivity of the occupant is going to be the main purpose of doing those uh, those benefit because if you look at it uh, people and, and 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 worker within the building are the most expensive uh, let's say expense uh, item in, uh, in in whole budget so we need to uh, keep keep them uh, uh, motivated, productive as much as you can, uh, save them time in, in, uh, in, in a way uh, the uh, interacting with the building and not wasting their time uh, to get service or to kind of uh, uh, communicate with what they need from, from the uh, uh, building management. Uh, I think uh, those are the main uh, benefit in, in my mind. Uh, I went. Uh, I thought I, I started with uh, a quote from uh, a national leader uh, before the IoT era and how they perceived the building. And I thought it's it's good to end with someone who actually implemented the IoT solution and saw the benefit of those solutions on their building. And this is from Jeff, uh, the ICC, who did lots of. Uh, IoT uh, project with uh, with IBM as well, and, and it's really strong quote here says every building has its own functions and personality, and the Internet of Things and cognitive computing enable us to understand and control uh, in a powerful new way uh, uh, that will transfer uh, transfer the way we uh, we manage and experience the buildings around the world. Uh, and, and this is a very powerful uh, quote, and it's actually aligned with the first quote, uh, quote from Mr. Churchill before the IoT era, is that they both agree that the way we manage our building, the way we build our building, is affecting our personality and our life. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions. Actually, Nadal, I'll jump in here. Uh, if someone uh, does have a question, uh, use the question panel uh, that's in your GoToWebinar control panel. So just type it in there and uh, we'll try to get to, uh, we do have time for uh, a few questions before we move on to Alex. Uh, so go ahead and uh, don't be shy, type them in if you've got questions coming. Uh, one of the things that, well, actually there's a, a whole lot of things that you opened up, uh, things that we can talk about, Nadal, in that presentation. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you is under the benefits, you mentioned tracking occupant comfort in real time. Can you give some examples of, of how one tracks occupant comfort in real time? Yeah, sure. Uh, there's a different use cases and many use cases that we can implement where we can uh, uh, track in real time the occupant uh, uh, satisfaction. Um, one of them, it could be uh, monitoring the areas and uh, where, of course, we're going to preserve the privacy of the of the occupant, but uh, monitoring the areas where the occupant is uh, hanging out or using more often, uh, and what's the area they are not using, uh, so we can have more insight about where where they where the occupant are spending most of their time, and then go to next step and say why they are going to this area, not to that area. Improving the area where they're not going to and kind of uh, uh, build on on the areas where they, they, uh, they're using more often and try to kind of uh, uh, spread the good things and different areas of, of the building. The other thing, is, uh, the other use cases, it, it could, could be uh, about adjusting their uh, the HVAC system, the temperature, without even waiting for the the, the occupant to to complain about it. Uh, so we can, uh, 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 by time, we can uh, know which is the best temperature for different areas. You know, sometimes area, some areas of the building is hotter than other areas need more. Uh, you know, uh, lower temperature to to make it even or make it comfortable. So these kind of uh, use cases. Will will help you monitoring uh, uh, and and, uh, uh, and monitoring the satisfaction and the comfort of the occupant in the building. Ah, excellent. That uh, that helps clarify things for me. Uh, Nadal, another question has come in. How is IoT 
going to help our buildings in a post-COVID-19 world? Well, it's uh, it's different also, different ways to do that. One of them is maintaining the social distance. Uh, with the IoT solution nowadays, we can uh, monitor if the occupant keeping the safe distance between each other, or social distance between each other, use, using uh, 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 image analysis and video analytics. Uh, also, you can uh, uh, see if the occupant are adhering and complying with the safety regulation, like wearing a mask or, uh, or uh, having gloves or something like that. So also with video analytics, you can uh, implement and enforce those uh, uh, new rules that comes after COVID-19. Uh, there's a big area for worker safety uh, where also you can monitor the location of the occupant. Are they going to a, can I, a dangerous location? Or they are uh, uh, getting into an area where they shouldn't be there? Uh, also using the video analytic or all uh, using uh, different kind of technology. Uh, but those of the came to my mind right now is that, uh, you know, uh, I'm implementing the, the new uh, rules for the new world that we start living in nowadays. Uh, very good, very good. And in truth, uh, I don't want to get too, too deep into that subject. I don't want to steal Alex's thunder later on because he's coming up talking about IoT and creating safer workplaces. Uh, a very interesting uh, question has come in. I'd, I'd be curious also to know where we are today with this, Nadal. Uh, but can you address where we are regarding automated self-healing and other machine learning capabilities? Yeah, well, in a building context, it, it self-healing, let's say, uh, for the uh, equipment, uh, the, uh, as I understand the question, if it's for the building, like we got a wealth of information uh, from the machine itself. Like I had uh, the privilege to work with some uh, pump manufacturer who want to monitor their, their equipment on real time and see if the failure is imminent or close so they can call the customers and and provide services even before the pump is is failing uh so a, in in terms of self self healing like the machine will heal itself i'm i'm not sure we reach our i don't I, I don't think we are at that stage yet but it's basically the machine can call the service by itself when it's feel that something wrong is going to happen to the to the uh, machine itself, uh, as far as uh, at that that level, we we are there. We can predict that the machine can can call the service when it needed, but the machine heal itself. I, I don't think we we are there yet. Ah, excellent. Uh, we've got time for one more question that has come in, Nadal, and then I'll I'll take you out of the hot seat there. Uh, what are the uh, key performance indicators uh, for overall occupant experience? Can you speak to that? Uh, the, the KPI from a, a, a occupant perspective, I think uh, it's it's basically uh, come to come down to their uh, uh, their number of complaints that uh, that they have about the building uh their uh, enjoyment of of the building uh, are they uh, satisfied with let's say a common area if there is a uh, an area for for let's say lunchtime or hangout or maybe uh some kind of uh, you know snack bar or whatever or these kind of things uh, uh, will will uh, impact the satisfaction of the of the occupant in in the building. Uh, also, I th I think it's it's also the design and the the uh, uh, the shape of of their their work area. Uh, some some people like the open concept, others cubicle thing. Uh, each one of them has pros and cons in in it. And, and how 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 satisfied these uh, occupants with their uh, work area is also uh, another uh, uh, another factor in uh, on their uh, measuring their satisfaction. Uh, very good, Nadal. Uh, there are a couple of other questions that have come in. But uh, we need to move on to our second speaker. Uh, so Nadal, thank you very much for that presentation. 
Before we move on to Alex, uh, I just want to uh, send out a quick reminder to please again take some time to visit our sponsors, Siemens and WatchNet. Now, Alex Ally is IoT Solution Lead with Siemens Canada Smart Infrastructure. He's an electrical engineer with a comprehensive knowledge of designing, developing, and maintaining electrical systems with a focus on IoT solutions for healthcare, commercial, and industrial. And uh, I think his uh, presentation is uh, quite timely considering uh, what we find ourselves in these days. Alex will talk to us about leveraging IoT to create a safer workplace and enable contact tracing. Take it away, Alex. Thanks for having me, Anthony. Good morning and welcome, everyone. Hope you and your families are keeping well. As businesses begin to craft and create plans to return to workplace, their primary objective is really to come up with a safe return to work strategy. Doing this work effectively will require long-term planning, comprehensive solutions, and consultations with experts from both the science and industry communities. Let's explore one of the ways in which building uh, environment can support businesses as they begin to reintroduce people into buildings and ultimately come back with confidence. Okay, so this is this is my favorite quote. Um, we all have failures in our lives. If we fail on something, that means we found a way that doesn't work. I like the positivity of this quote. Um, uh, founder of uh, light bulbs, uh, Thomas Edison. Uh, he is truly one of the people that really change our lives. Um, anyway, going back to our main topic today. Um, hey, everyone, I have a question for you. If we can um, put up the first poll. Okay, so where do you prefer to work? Stay safe and work from home. Return to office with health and safety measures. I would return to office now. I'd be really curious to see what are your answers. Interesting. That's what exactly I was expecting. Certainly people missing, you know, um, their coffee machine at work. So it is the reality that all of us have to go back to work at some point. And many companies are now coming out with a safe return to work strategy. This can be a range of solutions from thermal screening uh, to detect uh, an elevated body temperature, practice social distancing, contact tracing, air quality control, remote monitoring, capacity management, so on and so forth. We're going to talk about contact tracing today. And the first question comes to mind is, what is contact tracing and how does it work? In a nutshell, it means we trace back the employee interaction and identify those that have been exposed to someone infected. And the real question is why we do this. So the big challenge with pandemic situation is in the incubation period and those that are asymptomatic. In other words, you can be infected and still have not developed any symptoms. What are you going to do with this situation? You're keep is spreading the virus, but you know uh, you don't even know that you're infected. Just imagine if you're working in a manufacturing environment or even office type environment, and you spread the virus across the board. Um, and specifically in the meat food manufacturing situation, you might have like half of your workforce infected. This happened in in recent, you know, in the past couple months. And many of the meat manufacturing, food manufacturers, or other, you know, type of work and environment in Canada. Just imagine losing the half of workforce. What would be the economic impact to the overall operation? So certainly you'd have to shut down for at least two, three weeks. Um, and this is going to have massive impact on, on the revenue of the company. So this comes down to the play that how we can prevent the spread of the virus, which if Alex tests positive uh, uh, two days later, now I can trace back and identify all of the Alex interaction with, with, with his colleagues and identify who can be potentially exposed to, to the virus. So obviously technology is the main driver of this solution and uh, we are leveraging IoT, Internet of Things, 
uh, and activate and enable contact tracing. And one thing that I want to clarify here is contact tracing is different than tracking employees. We're not really tracking the employees, we are tracing back their interaction with other employees. So literally, I don't know how much you know a specific person or we wouldn't know how much a specific person spend you know in the bathroom. This is more of you know really understanding um, the human interaction per se. Okay, so uh, we really have um, few options uh, uh, for contact tracing. First um, would be really through video analytics. Um, this often, you know, trigger privacy concern. Uh, you would have to have an extensive uh, uh, hardware infrastructure uh, or uh, CCTV cameras throughout the facility in order to do uh, contact tracing. And then this is through face detection type of deal. The second option is anonymous contact tracing with uh, BLE security badges. Um, this is, you know, can, can be done with an Enlighted platform, which this is what we're going to discuss today. Uh, the third way is really through um, uh, uh, the mobile phones or cell phones and laptops through Wi-Fi signal. This is not going to be as accurate as the other technology, but still. But we also have fourth way, which I haven't included, uh, specifically in Canada, uh, uh, the, the government of Ontario in conjunction working with uh, Shopify and uh, 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 BlackBerry, I, I guess, uh, they're coming out with a mobile app where uh, this is going to be launched early July, which this is free app. Uh, all of the Canadians can download the app. What happens with the application, the Bluetooth signal is constantly searching for other Bluetooth signals. So you go to grocery shopping, uh, public places, this is constantly tracking. And, if, and, and obviously we would all have to contribute to this uh, overall experience. And if you are test positive, you would have to say, hey, I am positive. And then this is gonna trace back and identify who are the, 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 the interaction or you being you know, in, in close contact and grocery shopping type of deal with some people that you don't even know. So. Based on the first preliminary polls, only 25% of Canadians will subscribe to this, um, and 75 they they really concern about their privacy. Um, so we were going to stick for this presentation for anonymous contact tracing, which is specifically related to the office type application and uh, uh, in the working environment. All right. So there are really three solutions that comes uh, uh, with the BLE tag. Um, first and foremost is to identify the dense and populated area for a couple of reasons. Obviously, first would be you know to push notification and, and inform the occupants that they need to keep uh, social distancing or uh, respect to social distancing. And second really is to schedule maintenance and uh, from a cleaning disinfection perspective, it is important to identify what are the hot spots in the area or in the floor plan, what are the cool spots. And at the same time, identify the, the pattern, uh, the movement pattern. Uh, identify the primary motion trails, the secondary motion trails, and uh, so on and so forth. The second solution would be really connect occupants or employee to the building. Uh, through uh, enabling room booking or desk booking or giving access to occupants to change uh, the temperature settings uh, to the personal preference or change the lighting output, you know, take the control of the light, uh, uh, light intensity. But then really our focus today would be contact tracing of we use and leverage the infrastructure, the IoT infrastructure, and we trace back um, um, the, the human or employee interaction throughout the facility. All right, so I really want to envision and paint a picture of uh, what, it, what a day-to-day -day work, you know, look like if you want to implement contact tracing uh, in the building. And I'm sure most of you are thinking of privacy concern and how we address privacy concern because nobody wants to be traced or tracked at work. Um, so that's coming to the play that anonymous tracking is far more important than anything else. So when the employee arrives at work uh, at the building entry, um, 
Uh, the company will hand over security badges, which is an active tag work off of the Bluetooth. And that tag ultimately connects to the sensors in the ceiling. Um, there are a number of ways to, um, to, to kind of do this process or begin with this process. First and foremost is really the employee randomly picked a tag. We don't know who is, you know, taking this tag and um, uh, wearing that tag, but at least we know that they're all wearing these tags. So this would be completely anonymous. The second way is really we assign an ID tag uh, to a specific employee so we know who is wearing what. Um, and if obviously if someone, you know, uh, process to opt out, they can, you know, uh, simply say, no, we're not giving contact. Basically, once we are, start wearing the badge entering to the building, now our journey starts. The tags are constantly communicating with those sensors in the ceiling and identify our location. And any of the interaction we have will be recorded uh, for the sake of you know, our practice. So let's say two, three days later, an employee test positive. Now that a specific employee go, go back to HR and say, hey, I am positive, now the HR asks for the ID tags and uh, start searching on the system. Once put the ID badge, um, then it comes up with the list of employees that are uh, being in close contact with that a specific employee. And then once we, you know, uh, exit the, the building, there's no more sensors, obviously, and ultimately the location will be disabled until the next time the employee is returning back to work. Really want to show you a hands-on um, uh, experience uh, on the software and then how uh, the software could potentially help you. So as you can see um, uh, uh, on the top, we start or HR, you know, search for the ID tags, uh, the number of ways that that ID could be um, uh, assigned to a specific employee or it could be completely anonymous. And then we actually, you know, take the proximity, like uh, how, close, you know, they, they, they've got in contact with less than six feet, between six to 10 feet or above 10 feet. And then we want to do how much time they spend together, whether they had like only a short talk in the hallway for, for one minute or two minutes, or they've been in a conference call for two hours together um, uh, for talking about a specific project. And then we we're going to to trace back two weeks um, time frame to identify uh, what are the interaction. So what happens once we hit you know search is really giving you the list of ID tags uh, and the number of you know specific times and proximity that we actually um, had interaction together. So. Um, at this point, it really comes down to a couple different scenarios. If HR knows who is who, they can notify exactly the people that had you know, close contact. If the HR doesn't know who is who, uh, it just publish you know, the ID numbers, and the employees are responsible to search and identify if they are in that list or not. So this is really helping them to mitigate the spread of virus. So. Um, you might never catch uh, the virus with, with half an hour, you know, uh, interaction. But if you are at risk, it better start self-quarantine and wait about 10, 15 days and make sure you're not really spreading the virus um, in the office environment. How does contact tracing benefit the customer? And um, really leveraging IoT and what's the outcome of this implementation? So. First and foremost, social distancing. We identify and uh, practice social distancing in, in the office environment. And secondly, we can monitor cleaning. Um, so cleaning effort, I would imagine when we all go back to the office, we probably have double or triple the effort, cleaning effort that you used to have like three, four months ago. Um, and then the other thing is really occupancy limit or occupancy management. I would envision if we go back to the office, uh, we couldn't go at full force. We would have to be at 50% or 60% office capacity. So leveraging IoT platforms, really helping us to identify and understand uh, how many people are planning to go to the office even, right? Or if the office is filled with the capacity, 
you know that what's happening, especially with the industry moving towards the hotel desk. Um, this is important to understand how busy is the office tomorrow. So uh, um, we can leverage IoT application uh, to answer this. And then the, the secondly is the touchless entry, right? Um, utilizing the badges that uh, kind of eliminate the necessity of touching anything. Um, and ultimately, digital contact tracing, which um, uh, we already touched, um, these are really in direct benefits of implementing uh, an IoT application. If we move to the next slide, please, I'm sure pretty much uh, most of the people might question that how does the system work? And from a technical perspective, how we can implement such a, such a technology? So, um, at the beginning or the start, we implement sensors throughout the building. Uh, you know, you're looking at the, the, the one type of sensors that it's specifically for office. Different form factors could be for outdoor application, for a, a warehouse or manufacturing plant. But the rule of thumb is you're putting these sensors as your satellite, right? Um, this can be connected to light fixture and that's where we get power from. Uh, what's better than light fixtures? Because you'll find light everywhere. Or it can be operated completely standalone in the, in the, in the sense that um, we feed the power supply uh, to the sensors, uh, we power them up. And these sensors are communicate wirelessly so we eliminate you know, lots of wiring in place. What happens is uh, when the employee is wearing badges throughout the facility, uh, the badges are constantly communicating with the sensors in the ceiling. With the triangulation and estimate, you know, uh, uh, the location of the tag. So if you are in close contact with uh, any other employees, uh, technically it starts, you know, recording those interaction. And in case you want to trace back, um, that's basically, uh, you know, um, how the system uh, works, and then we're going to uh, record all of those close contacts. Uh, there is other ways to do it with mobile app. Now the Bluetooth signal from mobile app connects to those um, 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 sensors in the ceiling. But the challenge with mobile or cell phones is, I personally, when I'm in the office, I would never have my cell phone with me. So I will leave the cell phone, you know, on that, especially when I'm going to the bathroom or heating up my foods or you know, uh, going to printer. These these are like really the times that you don't necessarily take your cell phone with. So there is a risk, but if you having you know security badges, you you tend to wear it all the time. Um, so the technology is really now helping us uh, to create a safer environment, and um, obviously as part of safe return to work a strategy. Uh, this thing this is helping really the employers to come up with a with a proven you know uh, algorithm or method to keep the area and um, the environment a little bit more safer. So, as as an ending point, I want to ask you another question. So, if Anthony, can you uh, put up the the second poll? Yeah. So, which contact tracing option do you think is the best? In building with video analytics, anonymous tracing with BLE tags and sensors, that's what we discussed today, and enable contact tracing by a mobile app. Okay, let's see the results. There you go, that's exactly what I was expecting. 54% are voting for anonymous tracing uh, with uh, BLE tags. All right, now let's open up the line for questions. Uh, very good, Alex. I just needed to uh, unmute myself there. Um, hey, here's an interesting uh, question. Uh, so, Alex, uh, the the software that you were talking about here for contract, tra uh, sorry, contact tracing, is it conceptual in beta testing, or is it actually being deployed? And uh, sort of a, a, a footnote to that, uh, in terms of cost, you know, what is the estimated order of magnitude cost? per square foot uh, per employee to deploy? Right, that's a very good question. So this has been tested and uh, this, this has been launched uh, just recently. Like there was lots of, you know, an extensive effort, you know, putting into place, you know, to come up with, uh, uh, with this software in a short period of time. But thanks to um, 
the infrastructure, right? The IoT infrastructure did exist previously. It was just, you know, the matter of um, adding a different layer or another layer of software on top of the existing infrastructure. Uh, as far as cost goes, it really comes down to the health employee, right? Um, if you're talking about the employee's well-being, right, and their confidence go back to work, because obviously nothing's going to replace our interaction with, with our colleagues, right? I personally miss my, my friends, my colleagues at work. I certainly miss our coffee machine, right, uh, which gives me a quality coffee. Um, uh, this comes down to how much really worth your employee health, right? So uh, the cost really comes down to, it depends on the deployment, uh, depends on, you know, the existing infrastructure, infrastructure, really the cost is not substantial and comes down, you know, somewhere along, you know, $15, $20, 25 bucks per employee per month, which is really, really nothing, you know, considering what we're trying to achieve. Because uh, the, like I said, the economic consequence of not having such a system is a lot more substantial comparing to um, uh, mitigating the spread of wires, you know, uh, throughout the workforce. Uh, very good. Yes. Uh, how how do you put a price on safety? Uh, one of our uh, attendees is asking, uh, does it have to be a choice of one or the other or the third? Uh, are there situations perhaps where a hybrid approach, perhaps combining video analytics, perhaps combining BLE, uh, any situations where those might make sense? Yeah, it's a very good question. So um, that all depends on the existing infrastructure, like I said, right? And obviously, it would be redundant if you do not have CCTV cameras in place or you do not have uh, the, the sensors in place and put all of them together, right? So obviously, the more solution you've got, right, the accuracy would be, would be, um, uh, would, would, would kind of jump and then it's going to be higher. But then the real challenge is you have multiple application, multiple software to, to kind of uh, navigate through, right? So from my standpoint, we really have to stick uh, case by case is different. Uh, some people don't really care about uh, the privacy. So uh, working environment are different, you know, one place to another. Uh, maybe video analytics uh, might be the better place. Uh, in some other places, especially in the office environment, I wouldn't imagine that, you know, uh, employees are interested to have cameras, you know, throughout the place. So. Case by case, it would be different, but um, I think it all comes down, the outcome is the same, right? We all want to mitigate the spread of virus. Uh, thank you for that, Alex. Uh, there is a, we do have a little bit more time. So there's a, a question that came in uh, shortly after Nadal wrapped up. And uh, now Nadal, I think you're, you're still uh, with us. Uh, so I'd like to put this question first to Nadal, uh, and then Alex, uh, after Nadal answers, if you want to throw in uh, uh, your your own uh, uh, opinion on this matter, that would be greatly appreciated. But um, in terms of, uh, we've got um, Bobby asking, uh, what do you believe is the biggest challenge? And and again, I'll have Nadal answer first before you, Alex. What is the biggest challenge okay. preventing today's building owners in moving forward with implementing cognitive or digital building solutions? to let their building work for them. And kind of as a little footnote to that, uh, do you think that the consultant community is reluctant to propose these solutions in the market? Let me start with this. It's a very excellent question and I actually summarize the obstacle that, that prevent not only IoT, but all emerging technology going into the market. But I will, I will focus on a smart building or buildings uh, area. The first myth is that the owner of the building thinking that the emerging technology or IoT is only for new buildings. That's not the truth. You can implement those solution even with old uh, buildings. As I mentioned in one of my slides, if you don't have the sophisticated advanced systems in your building, you can uh, uh, you can uh, start with uh, individual sensor for individual assets and then building on top of that and moving from one piece to another piece in your building. So 
IoT or emerging technology is not only for the old building, it, for, for the new building, it can be implemented for an old building. The other thing is that the math pay, saying about, you know, it's very expensive, it's gonna cost me arms and a leg to, to kind of implement these solution. That's also not true. Uh, the, some of these solution is really, uh, uh, is, I wouldn't say cheap, but its return on investment is very significant, especially around energy and utility uh, 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 monitoring and and, um, and and also preserving resources for the building. Uh, so that that's another area. Is thinking that it's really expensive. It's not. And the other thing is thinking this is going to be very complex solution. It's very complicated. It's adding a new, you know, devices and a new tier, a new layer where I need to manage and hire more people to do it. That's also not true because actually what it does, it's it's actually simplify your management and adding an abstract layer to your underneath complicated, already complicated system. So so those are in what comes to my mind is an obstacle for getting into those in term of the consulting uh, community reluctant to uh, approach uh, the uh, smart building I, I think uh, many companies like uh, IBM Siemens uh, and others are, are are really innovative and creative in coming up with a different kind of solution uh, for the building uh, but as I said, those obstacles actually prevent uh, uh, prevent owner from taking the the I wouldn't say the risk, but the initiative to kind of try it out, think about it, and start uh, you know uh, start the journey. Yeah, we we have to start this journey. There's nobody can deny the benefit of these technologies into the building and in preserving the resources and. And, and also saving uh, uh, operation cost for 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 them. Uh, thank you for that, Nadal. Yeah. Now, now I'll put the same question to Alex. What what is preventing building owners today from from moving forward on these technologies? And uh, sure. and do you think the the consultant community is reluctant to broach the subject? Right. So I think that the the, the one of the biggest challenges that we have historically seen in, in emerging, you know, the buildings towards uh, towards the smart building is really we've got so many different modules in the building. We've got lighting, HVAC, like curtains or, or shade control, CCTV, security, like we've got so many different modules and often so many different platforms to control every single module. So first and foremost is really interoperable. The, the solution or the module has to be interoperable uh, and work with other application, right? First and foremost. And the other thing is really you need a software management to control everything in the single pane of glass, right? And often it was a very good point that Nadal brought up. Sometimes they think that costs fortune, right? In the case of uh, uh, contact tracing that we discussed today, once we connect it to lighting, right? There is an energy saving that comes with it, right? So the energy saving coming from the lighting and HVAC control can pay up for the existing or uh, the, the, the initial investment, right? And then the benefit from, you know, comes from spatialization, contact tracing, or employee productivity would have a direct positive impact to the, employee, to the, to the company revenue, right? So I think first and foremost is really to make sure just to con like a conclusion, um, make sure the different modules are interoperable, right? Open platforms, you can share, you know, data through API. You can take the control of different systems uh, and create this a smart ecosystem or building digital twin in the building, right? Uh, as far as the consultant goes, uh, we're working with uh, a number of consultants that they have this vision and. They, they paint the picture for their customers that this is how we would have to go from point A to point B of transforming an old building and not necessarily a, a new construction uh, or retrofit the existing building and transform them to an, some sort of a smart building per se. 
Uh, thank you for that, Alex. We've got just a few minutes time for one last question. Uh, Alex, I will put it to you first, and uh, and then if Nadal sure. has something to add as well, then we'll have Nadal speak. Uh, but uh, David asks, would something like building intelligence quotient uh, or a rating system like LEAD, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, improve the acceptance and perhaps the desire of smart IoT buildings? One of the major benefits, I mean, we talk about 330-300 rule um, all the time. For those that don't know, you know, what this is, it's an operational cost. $3 per square foot for uh, for the utility, $30 per square foot to rent that space, $300 per square foot for people. With the IoT application, you're really tackling every single of these pillars not only on utility, but understanding how efficiently we utilize the space and ultimately how I can improve uh, occupant productivity. So um, I would think we can achieve this um, uh, by implementing, you know, working with uh, with IoT applications. Ah, very good. And Nadal, I'll put uh, the same question to you if you have something more to add. Will things like building intelligence quotients or leadership in energy and environmental design improve the acceptance of smart buildings? Yeah, for sure. For sure. I, I, I think we need to uh, uh, to do uh, uh, more work in terms of uh, uh, increasing the, uh, the uh, uh, acceptance uh, among the building owner for this new technology. It's a kind of education and also uh, spreading the word of the benefit for these new systems or new technology. Uh, 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 just one point that uh, came to my mind right now is that uh, IoT and, and also data analytic and other, it's not only focusing on energy, it's not focusing on uh, uh, utilities and resources of the building, it's, uh, it's a, it's a it, it, it's a new kind of uh, systems that enable you to understand how your building operate. It, it, it's, it's not only electricity, it's not only water, it's not only HVAC. It's also about the occupant, how they behave, where they're going, how they mean, uh, how they're using the facilities within your system. It, it's, it's a bigger picture than only uh, saving uh, money on, on resources for the building. But I, I, I don't uh, undermine the, the, the value of saving uh, on, on energy and resources because that's the main capital saving or the main expenses uh, item that you're going to save uh, from that. But also productivity and increasing productivity of the occupant is another big factor that we need to look at. Very good. Thank you, Nadal. And uh, those were uh, Nadal Kwasmi with IBM Canada and Alex Ally with Siemens Canada. Thanks again, gentlemen. And of course, a special thanks to our sponsors, Siemens and WatchNet. Please visit them when you have a chance. Don't forget to bookmark the forum where you'll find the pre-recorded video sessions with Ted Malucci, Brian Jones, and Henry Frank, and where I will be uploading recordings of today's speakers, Nadal and Alex. And of course, thanks to all of you for attending and thanks for your wonderful questions. This concludes the live portion of the building's IoT forum. Everyone, have an excellent day.